This is Philosophy Bites with me, David Edmonds. And me, Nigel Warburton. Philosophy Bites is available at www.philosophybites.com. Philosophy Bites is made in association with the Institute of Philosophy. The following statement seems uncontroversial. It's wrong to torture children. It's not difficult to get people to sign up to such a proposition. Yet, under the influence of various strains of postmodernism, many now also insist that morality is relative. And since morality is relative, such people often add, we should withhold criticism of those who don't share our values. For example, we in the West may believe in various human rights, but that's just our value system. It's not grounded in any form of objectivity. Paul Bogosian is based at New York University. Moral relativists, he argues, are in the grip of a fundamental confusion. Paul Bogosian, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Very good to be here. We're focusing on moral relativism. Could you just say what that is? I'll try. I think people have had various different ideas by what they're going to mean by um, relativism in general, moral relativism in particular. I tend to think of it as people striving to occupy a position that is halfway between moral absolutism on the one hand and moral nihilism or moral limitivism on the other, where you drop all serious use of moral or normative vocabulary. I think a very good model for that is given by the famous cases drawn from physics. People used to believe that there was absolute motion, though Galileo taught us that there is no such thing, that motion has to be thought of as relative to a variable frame of reference. And so we became relativists about motion. That's a very nice example in which we reject the idea that there is such a thing as absolute motion, but it's not as though we're thinking that, therefore, all motion talk is useless and needs to be eliminated. It's rather that we should be relativists about motion. The idea there is that there is some relativized notion of motion that plays something like the same explanatory role that absolute motion did, and which therefore qualifies it to be a species of the same genus. So you might think that following the realisation that there is no God, people eliminated these absolute moral rules as completely binding on everybody in every occasion, and we're now left with a position where morals are relative to culture. That's right. I think that's what a lot of people think. I think they're very um, mystified by how there could be absolute facts about right and wrong, good and bad, in the absence of a supreme being. So people who are uh, unwilling to derive their morality from a religion are faced with the quandary of how to go about using moral vocabulary in the face of that absence. And so moral relativism looks like a coherent position that is halfway between, on the one hand, moral absolutism and the rejection of all moral talk altogether. So one reason why people might be tempted to embrace moral relativism is the diversity of moral opinion. Right. I think diversity by itself doesn't really give you a very good ground for believing in moral relativism, though diversity coupled with the idea that the people who are involved in the disagreement are not really making a mistake, or what you might think of as an equivalent idea, that these disputes, when they arise, are rationally irresoluble. I think those give you a very strong reason for being skeptical about moral absolutism, and therefore, especially in light of the fact that it's very hard to see how one can proceed without using some normative vocabulary to relativizing that vocabulary to either one's culture or one's own individual moral code. So the fact that some people think that eating beef is acceptable, others don't, and that may be culturally relative, isn't in itself sufficient to end up with moral relativism? Well, the eating practices and kind of prohibitions are complicated because they tend to be bound up with certain religious traditions and rituals and so on, and one might very well take the view that vis-à-vis a certain range of issues in which one might include, for instance table manners and greetings and the way they're tied up with rituals that are part of one's cultural history, that one should take a very tolerant attitude towards divergences on that kind of score. But we have a very good model for explaining how that works, and that is the model that's provided by cases of etiquette in general. To understand etiquette, you have to understand that it's based on the existence of an absolute and universal norm 
that says that with respect to a certain range of behaviors, for instance, greetings and table manners and, and maybe dietary traditions, one should do whatever it is that the local custom does, other things being equal. And that's not a pure case of relativism because it's based on the existence of a certain kind of absolute norm that has in it a place for a parameter, namely one's cultural location, that can vary widely. I think a lot of people, when they think about moral relativism, have that kind of case in mind. Could you give an example of that? There's a question of how noisily one eats one's food, for instance. In the West, you're supposed to be fairly quiet and eating soup and not slurp. But I'm told that in certain parts of Asia, it's actually good manners to slurp your noodles noisily because it shows that you're relishing the food and you're thereby complimenting your hosts for serving such delicious fare. And so there is a certain kind of moral pressure to do the thing which, were you back at home, you would not do. And yet there are groups of people, I can think of some English football fans, for instance, who resolutely refuse to adhere to what you call the universal moral norm of respecting the etiquette of other countries. Right. Well, sometimes people behave unethically, of course. That could be one explanation. The other is that all of these requirements or normative requirements, moral requirements, are prima facie requirements that have to be thrown into a mix of other considerations. And it may very well be that, depending on what some of one's other moral convictions are, one sometimes is best off ignoring some local custom rather than adhering to it. But all of that is a discussion that one is having fully within the normative realm of what is the as it were, absolutely correct thing to do in these circumstances. But surely many moral judgments are relative to circumstance. Well, that's absolutely right, of course. What the right thing to do is may very well depend on the circumstances. That doesn't make it relativism. You often find a conflation of moral relativism with the humdrum fact that what the right thing to do in a given situation may well depend on various features of that situation. So to give an example that I think Tim Scanlon gives, somebody's broken down on the side of the road, should you stop and help them? Well, it depends on what time of day it is and whether there are other people around who are able to help the person in need. You've got a serious medical emergency. If all of that's true, you may, of course, drive on by. But if it's the middle of the night, it's freezing out there, the person will perish and you have nothing more urgent to do, then you ought to stop. So that's an example in which what you ought to do depends on the circumstances. But, of course, any absolutist will concede this or embrace it readily because it's just part of the weighing up of the considerations that lead to a normative verdict about the case. Now, what some people also think is that there are certain issues, for instance, the abuse of children for fun, that don't depend on any circumstance. So they tend to focus on those when it comes to trying to generate a debate between relativism and absolutism, because they provide very pure cases. The relativist, in some sense, wants to say there is a dependence on something, and the absolutist wants to say that when you've finished entering all the qualifications about the circumstances, it doesn't depend on anything further. The crucial thing is whether you think that there is a dependence on moral code in generating the verdict, or whether you think it just depends on the circumstances. I suppose some of that confusion could have arisen from the sort of thing that Immanuel Kant said about the crazy axe man at the door. The guy shows up at the door looking for your friend who's inside and most people's instinct would be to lie and they think it was morally right to lie to send the axe man off somewhere else. But Kant famously said, no, no, you should never tell a lie. That doesn't seem to be allowing for any sort of subtlety of circumstances, and that is the absolutist sort of position that the relativist stands in contrast to. Ah, but you see, it would be a a mistake to take the two sides of that dispute about the Kantian question as illustrating absolutism and relativism. They could just be two different answers that an absolutist might give to that question, and in fact, it seems to me, Kant was crazy to think that there'd be no circumstances under which it would be correct to lie. The question then becomes, well, how do we tell the difference between an absolutist and a relativist, given that there's dependence on something that's embraced by both? And I think the crucial distinction is that the relativist thinks that moral verdicts depend on what the agent's or the community's moral code is, whereas what the absolutist 
is claiming. There is a single true moral code. We just have to figure out exactly which qualifications it enters on which particular moral verdicts. So how do you decide between those two options? Well, one of the things that I'm inclined to think is that the idea that a moral truth can depend on a background moral code is incoherent when you really get down to what it means. And there are two, at least two, main considerations that drive this. One of them is that when you ask yourself, look, what kind of a judgment is it to say, not this is wrong, but this is wrong relative to my moral code, it looks as though the judgment that relativizes the wrongness or the rightness of an act to a background moral code is just a descriptive remark and not a normative remark of any kind. So it would be as though, in the case of motion, we haven't succeeded in defining something that is the relativistic cousin of absolute motion, but simply gotten rid of the notion altogether. And the way we know this is that if you take an example of a relativized judgment of that kind, for instance, eating beef is permissible relative to the code of the the West, anyone, no matter what their normative convictions are, can agree with that because it's just a logical remark about the relation between the code and what it delivers. So even a Hindu who disagreed that eating beef is permissible would agree that relative to the code of the West, it is permissible. So what you're saying is that when somebody says, look, this is a relative moral judgment, it's relative to my culture, from another perspective, that's just a sociological fact. It's no longer moral at all. It's just purely describing the belief that they happen to hold relative to other beliefs that are common in that culture. There's no moral element left there. It's dissolved. That's the claim, although people have this feeling that they're somehow occupying some midway position where they've retained some use of moral vocabulary but are somehow relativizing it to their background convictions. Really what they've done is bleached it of all moral or normative content. And the way we can see this is by seeing that somebody else who intuitively holds a very different normative position is completely able to agree with these relativized moral judgments. Now, how could that be if there was any real moral content there to begin with? So if I say slavery was morally permissible in 18th century England, I'm merely describing a fact about how people behaved. Well, that seems right, doesn't it? I mean, we'd have to say that uh, if we're doing a correct history. And it would obviously not involve any moral endorsement whatsoever. Now, if we wanted to add some element of condemnation or approval to all that, which is what you would need to do in order to bring the normative back into play, how would you do that without compromising the relativism, the anti-absolutism that you're now trying to embrace? If you do it by saying, and by the way, some of these codes are correct or incorrect and so forth, well, that would get you back into the soup of trying to explain what these absolute attitudes are about, given that you don't think that there are any absolute facts out there. Or if you did that in some more non-cognitive way by saying, well, this is, this is simply how I prefer to live, then we can acknowledge that as an option, but that would really be to have given up normative vocabulary altogether and substituted in its place the language of power and of fact. When you relativize, it looks as though you lose the subject matter. So now, if I'm right, we face this very stark choice and we start asking ourselves some difficult questions about whether we can make do without normative vocabulary. So we then confront things like, pedophilia, genocide, or any of the things that engage our moral sensibilities the most. And we ask ourselves, would we be satisfied simply saying, I don't like that, I don't approve of that, I don't want to live in a world in which there is that? Or do we think, no, there's got to be a stronger judgment available because what I feel about this cannot be properly captured just by saying, I don't want this. This might seem quite an academic debate. Does it really matter which way we jump on the, on the issue? I think the question whether we are able to use moral judgments with an absolutist character matters a great deal to how we are able to conduct ourselves and to how we feel about the way in which others do. If this argument is correct, then we face a very stark choice between engaging in moral judgments that are absolutist in their nature versus simply having to talk about our preferences. 
and we ask ourselves whether we're able to think everything that we need to think when we're confronted by particular kinds of human failing and atrocity, the abuse of children for fun, for instance. Do we think that everything that we feel about that can be adequately captured simply by talking about our preferences? Or do we think that we need to have at hand moral judgments with real moral content? Is one of the payoffs, as it were, of going for the absolutist fork here, suggesting that moral relativism or relativism is a non-starter, that you can then judge other cultures without fear of committing some kind of reasoning error of extending our own personal morality into inappropriate areas? Well, it's certainly not the motivation behind this work. I do think that um, we probably don't know how to get by without using normative vocabulary with, with normative force. Therefore, that we have at some point or other to resort to moral judgments with an absolutist content. But it is not driven by any presumption on my part that I know what the correct moral facts are and therefore can dictate them or at least tell other people about them. That's an epistemological matter which I think remains hugely vexed and controversial. I think we need to think much, much harder than we have about exactly how we go about finding what the absolute moral facts are. And even if we thought that we were in possession of them, it still wouldn't follow. It probably wouldn't follow as a moral matter of fact that we should impose them on anybody else. Obviously, I'm not saying that I know what the right answer is or not saying that anybody knows what the right answer is, but I'm only emphasizing that we have to think that there is a right answer. Paul Bogosian, thank you very much. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. There's now a Philosophy Bites book published by Oxford University Press. For more information, go to www.philosophybites.com. For more information about the Institute, go to www.philosophy.sas.ac.uk. Thank you.